Welcome to Season 2 of Purdue University College of Sciences Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to science. If you have a science question, tweet it to us at Purdue SOS, and we will try and find someone to answer it for you. Today on Superheroes of Science, we have Michelle Thompson, Assistant Professor with the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences here at Purdue. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me. We appreciate you showing up. Absolutely. All right, so planetary. Yes, you're yes, planetary, planetary science. Yes. Planetary science. Mm -hmm. And so what's, what, what's your groove? What's your thing? So I work mostly with planetary materials. So that means basically space rocks. So I worked with everything uh, from Apollo samples that were brought back by the astronauts in the 60s and 70s to uh, samples that have been brought back to Earth from robotic spacecraft missions like wow. uh, Japanese Space Agency has a, had a few missions and, and other NASA missions to asteroids and comets. Wait, wait, wait. Um, back up just a hair. Yeah. We have, as in humankind, went out and got samples from asteroids and comets? Yes, absolutely. So there was a mission oh, that NASA... Why don't I know this? There was a mission that NASA ran called the Stardust Mission, which collected particles that came off of a comet. And the Japanese Space Agency had a mission called Hayabusa, and that collected dust particles from the surface of an asteroid. And right now, we actually have two ongoing missions, one run by NASA and one run by the Japanese Space Agency, that are both collecting samples from really organic, rich asteroids. And those will be brought back to Earth in the next one to three year time frame. Wow. Yeah. How, how do we how do we know that the, there's organic, the organic rich, how do we know that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we look at the spectral characteristics of the asteroid, so mm -hmm. that's the way that mm -hmm. light looks after it reflects off the surface, and we compare that to meteorites that we have that have just come to Earth, you know, by happenstance. And so the, the meteorites that look really similar to these asteroids that we're going to visit are the ones that have organic material in them. So we're expecting to find organics in the samples we bring back from these asteroids. Yeah, that's very exciting. What, what, wait a minute, organic, <laughs> organic's like life, right? So I mean, what, not, not actual we life, we're just talking about organic molecules, that means things with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, some things that are building blocks to life, but we're not expecting to find little green men or bacteria uh, or anything like that, okay. no, yeah. But Ooh. still pretty exciting, these are the things that may be seeded life on, on Earth in the early solar system, so it would be pretty oh. great to have those samples back. I had seen a recent post about the importance of these missions and bringing things back, so yeah, so bringing, I work mostly with return samples, and mm -hmm. they're really important for our understanding of the solar system because while spacecraft are great and robots are great that mm -hmm. we send to other planets, they don't have the same capabilities in terms of the analytical techniques that we can put on those sorts of instruments. So there are, there are techniques that we use in the laboratory that you can only do here on Earth. Okay. And so bringing those samples back really widens and sort of broadens the types of analyses that we can do with those materials. And that gives us a way better understanding of the, the planetary bodies they come from. What's the bigger question that you're trying to figure out by studying these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I work mostly... Your question led into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I work mostly on questions of the evolution of these bodies. So I specifically study planets or planetary bodies that don't have atmospheres. We call those airless planetary bodies. And because they don't have atmospheres, they don't have a layer of protection, basically, from their exposure to space. So we've got energetic particles that are coming off the mm -hmm. sun and the mm -hmm. solar wind that are continually bombarding the surface. And we also have very, very small dust particles that are, you know, micron-sized dust particles that would be burned up in our atmosphere here on Earth, but on places like the moon or asteroids, they don't have that protection, and so they're hitting the surface all the time. Wow. So both of those processes change the chemistry and the microstructure of material that's on the surface, and those changes in turn affect the optical properties, the, so the things that we observe with our remote sensing spacecraft, mm -hmm. our, our spacecraft that go into orbit around these uh, these different planetary bodies. So I study the samples that come back to understand how those changes affect the optical properties so that we can actually get a reliable understanding of the composition of surfaces from from other types of missions. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But you're doing ones mostly collected, not like meteorites? 
Sometimes I use meteorites for as analogs. So we, mm -hmm. unfortunately, although I wish we could, we can't get samples back from every single planetary body that we go to. But we still need to understand this alteration process on the surface so that we can put the data from missions into context. So I do use meteorites as analogs. So I can I use experiments in the laboratory to kind of simulate these processes with, with meteorites. And then we can apply it to different planetary bodies, even those that we're not going to bring samples back from. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, two questions. I'm sorry for calling you. You say analog. You use them as analog. Could yes. you explain mm -hmm. what you mean by that? Yeah, so we think of it as an analog, meaning that they probably have a similar chemical composition, they probably have the same minerals or very similar types of minerals that we expect on other planetary bodies. So while we don't know, while well, we don't have samples from those planetary bodies, we think these are close enough that we can use them as a simulant sort of thing for, okay. for these. So kind of like um, a reference yeah. material? Yeah, kind of mm -hmm. like a reference material. So there's people that do analog work here on Earth where they go and study, for example, impact craters mm -hmm. or areas where they might think there's potential for, you know, habitability, you know, astrobiology sorts of things. Those are also analogs, just I use them in a material sense instead of an environment sense. Yes. Yeah. Now, it's because I reserved the right to ask two questions. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> see, I did I'm that, so I, I, so I knew I get my say when yeah. it Here's a question that I get a lot. Okay. We as a department get a yes. lot. A lot of people come in with a rock. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I know your, the question. I see your shoulders sink just a little oh, yes. bit. <laughs> yes. Uh, they come in with a rock, and they're like, we found this meteorite. It's a meteorite. It's and always so, a meteorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's, sometimes it's, I mean, it, it kind of hurts your heart because yes. they're, they're, they're so sure, and this is, and yes. I, I mean, it's, I, you look at it, I'm like, well, that's a piece of granite. Um, hmm. yeah. it's, I mean, it's, you get these random ones, and, it's, mm -hmm. it, and some of them, I know enough to be dangerous mm -hmm. myself, I, but it, I, that's plenty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, those aren't a lot of times. Yes. So what, if I find a rock outside, mm -hmm. what are some characteristics that would either say, oh, this possibly could be, or, uh-uh, here's something. Yeah, so there's a few things that, uh, so I've done a lot of these ident <laughs> identifications uh, as well, and there's a few things that are, are really kind of dead ringers for a meteorite. So one thing is that the, the rock is coming in through Earth's atmosphere, and it's, you know, it's basically burning up as it's coming in. So it has a really, something called a fusion crust on the outside. So something that is really dark, usually black, very smooth, often a uh, matte kind of color. It's not sh usually shiny. And that will coat kind of the, the whole exterior of the, of the rock. Um, if it has, if it's an iron meteorite, sometimes the way that it comes in through the atmosphere will, the aerodynamics of that will form these sort of grooves or depressions on the surface that we call regmaglyphs. And those are also a dead giveaway. We don't see that kind of texture on, uh, on terrestrial rocks. Also, if you have a magnet handy, usually meteorites have a lot of iron or iron nickel metal in them, which is very magnetic. And so a magnet will stick to the outside of one of these um, types of samples. Uh, other things, if, if you can see the inside of the rock, the most common type of meteorite we have on the Earth are ones that are composed of tiny little spherules of, of minerals. And so if you see lots of little circular features inside the rock, that usually is a good indicator that it could be a meteorite. Um, things that definitely are dead giveaways, it's not a meteorite. If you see any sort of bubbles or vesicles on the surface, that one is really common because there's a lot of material from mine, mining operations yeah. that mm -hmm. look like have all of these characteristics. They're magnetic, they have a black you know, coating on the surface, but oftentimes they will have these sort of bubbles on the surface or, or throughout it, and meteorites don't have that. So that's pretty much the one dead giveaway that you don't have a meteorite. Okay. Yeah. Those are the things that I usually use for, for the first level of identification. Mm -hmm. I've gotten a few that seem like they could be, and then you, you know, go in and do some more detailed chemical analyses, and nope, they're just earth rocks, but yeah. Maybe one day mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, I'll have someone bring one in and I'll actually get to tell them that, yes, you have found a meteorite, <laughs> yeah. which would be great. <laughs> so where do these, where do they come from? The meteorites that we find? Yeah, mm -hmm. where in the world are they, these things coming from? Yeah, so they, the meteorites are coming from 
the majority of them are coming from asteroids that are out in the main asteroid belt. So between Mars and Jupiter, we've mm -hmm. got um, a bunch of small bodies that, that uh, comprise the main asteroid belt. If there are disruptive events, like a big impact, then we're breaking pieces of those asteroids off, and then they're making their way to Earth over you know, some period of time. On Earth, we find them all over the place. Uh, you could, there's been meteorites that have been found here you know, in Lafayette, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a couple places that we go which improve our chances of finding meteorites. One of those is Antarctica. So mm -hmm. there is a, a, a program called ANSMET, which is the Antarctic Search for Meteorites. And you can go down and spend, you as a person can go and volunteer mm -hmm. for this program and go and spend three months in Antarctica driving around on snowmobiles out on the glaciers and the ice sheets looking for rocks. And we go there because, <laughs> you know, it's covered in snow and ice. Mm -hmm. Everything is very white. These rocks are uh, black, these meteorites, that, so they're very easy to find. Yeah. Also, how would a rock get into the middle of an ice sheet in Antarctica unless it had fallen there from the sky? Mm -hmm. So it's a, very, it's a great place to go and find them, and you don't, you're not confusing it with a lot of other terrestrial rocks because it's just an ice sheet. Mm -hmm. And then the other place we go is uh, a lot of people get meteorites from Northwest Africa, where it's kind of the same same sort of setup, but it's sand dunes. And so no. you see lots of sand dunes, mm -hmm. and then there's these big black rocks in the middle of the dunes. How did they get there other than from falling from the sky? So those are two very common places that we go to find meteorites on Earth. Is there much, I mean, is the success rate very high? It's pretty good. So it, you, it varies a lot depending on the area of Antarctica they go to and the, um, and the year. But this year they just came back and I think they got over 300 candidate wow. meteorites. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they, they usually, you know, find plenty. And then those get all cataloged and classified and then they're available for the research community. So there's a bulletin that goes out every year that shows all the new meteorites and the types of, oh. of meteorites that they are so that you can, you know, request samples to work on in the lab. How neat. Mm -hmm. Very cool. But you say asteroid. Um, can we define, because we hear things like comets and asteroids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but can we define what those really are? What does that mean? Yeah, so an asteroid is really a primitive material that has been around since the very beginning of the solar system, for the most part that haven't undergone any significant processing since their formation. So they haven't usually most of the asteroids out there haven't been completely remelted. There hasn't been, you know, vulc volcanism mm -hmm. or things that we see on the surface of the Earth. They're usually pretty small bodies, much smaller than, you know, pl the planets or the or the moons for most of our um, other planets. And they have really primitive composition. So they are really a record of what the first solids were that were forming in our early solar system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Comets are... are um, are bodies that usually have some activity associated with them. So they've got a lot of volatiles, things like ices, uh, that if they get close enough to the sun, they can start melting and outgassing, which is why we see comets that have tails, because that's the material that's coming off mm -hmm. um, of the comet oh. once it gets close enough to the sun. But asteroids don't usually have that level of activity, um, although there are a few exceptions, or what we call active asteroids, but those are pretty rare. And are asteroids visible from the Earth if we're just looking up? Could we see? With your naked eye, you're uh, probably not going to see asteroids, mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of telescopes that focus on characterizing the population, not only in the main belt, but mm -hmm. also near-Earth asteroids. So mm -hmm. every once in a while, you'll hear a new story about an asteroid that comes really close to the Earth yeah. and you know missed us by however many thousand miles or something. Um, and there are are telescopes and programs that are dedicated only to finding those asteroids, oh. which we call near-Earth asteroids, because okay. those can pose a risk. Everybody's seen Armageddon, right? right. You know, yeah. if an asteroid <laughs> coming towards us, yeah. we're probably not going to send Bruce Willis to, um, to you know, do his business on, on one of those asteroids. But a lot of times we don't have a, much warning that those asteroids mm -hmm. are coming near us. So, yeah, it hmm. can be, you know, pretty surprising when these when these uh, bodies come really close to the Earth. Wow. How big or small one is going to make it through our atmosphere without burning up and why does it burn up? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what the actual size would be but we have seen, uh, we know that material the size of like a small car has gotten through and survived and we've actually witnessed those. There was a, um, a meteorite that came in called the Chelyabinsk meteorite. If you mm -hmm. remember a few years ago 
there were all these videos landed in Russia. Yeah, yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of videos. A lot of Russians have, have dash cams. So yeah, all of those. That's when I found out they have yeah. dash cams. Yeah, everywhere. yeah. I want one. <laughs> and so I think they they found out that that asteroid was probably the size of you know like a Volkswagen Beetle. I could be wrong on that, um, but those definitely are going to survive. I think the it's the process of coming through that actually causes a disruption of the larger body into many smaller bodies. And then once they're smaller, then they can get fragmented and they're, you know, they're much more likely to be burned up to spend it, depending on how actually small they get. But, um, yeah, so something that big is definitely going to make its way through. If it's, you know, you see these movies of things that are hundreds of meters yeah. in diameter, mm -hmm. you know, that's definitely going to you know, <laughs> be a bad day for us if that were to, to come our direction. Hmm. And so why, why do most of the small ones, why do they burn up? Why don't they get to us? So the really, really small ones, as they're coming in through the atmosphere, they're kind of undergoing, you know, melting processes. They're coming in really fast. Mm -hmm. So you know, several tens of kilometers per second. And it's their friction and their interaction with the material in the atmosphere that's causing this sort of melting. And then if they're small enough, they're just going to, you know, be melted and vaporized away. Hmm. So it's the buildup of the friction as it goes through the atmosphere and all the air molecules? Yeah, I think okay. so. Not really my area of expertise, but it's definitely, um, yeah, to do with, with the interaction with the material in that. I was hoping area. that's what it was, because that's what I'm taught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds good validity. to me. Sounds good to me, yeah. <laughs> I'm mostly worried about places where we don't have an atmosphere, so I'm like, ah, I don't think about yeah, those things about too that. much. Yeah. <laughs> Earth, man. Yeah, Earth, man, who needs it? Yeah. Yeah. So you said you do some chemical analysis on yeah. the the samples that are brought back mm -hmm. from missions. What types of things are you looking at? So I look a lot at what the uh, composition of the minerals are and mm -hmm. how those have changed. Um, and the tools that I use are a lot of electron microscopes. So everyone knows what a regular light microscope is. You mm -hmm. probably yeah. looked at it in, you know, through in biology class, maybe looked at some cells or something like that. So I use a version of a microscope like that, but instead of a beam of light that we use, we use a beam of electrons, mm -hmm. which are at very, very high energy. And they have wavelengths that are much shorter so that we can probe things that are much smaller. Okay. So the types of, of microscopes that I use, we can see down to the atomic level. So we oh, can wow. see individual columns of atoms in, in these you know, grains that have been brought back from other planets. And that's really important for, for the type of work I do because the processes, these solar wind ions, the micrometeorite impacts, those are changing things on very, very small scales. Mm -hmm. So 50 to 60 nanometers, and a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 meters. So very, very tiny things, almost on the atomic level. But those tiny changes have global effects because they're changing the properties that we observe with our with our remote sensing spacecraft and our mm -hmm. spectrometers. So we need to study things very, very small to understand processes that are very, very big. So I use the electron microscope to look at changes in the chemistry at that level mm -hmm. and also changes in the microstructure. So most mineral grains on the surfaces of planets have a very predictable ordered structure which defines what mineral they are. Mm -hmm. The atoms within the mineral are arranged in a certain way. But processes like melting, vaporization uh, that come with micrometeorite impacts, mm -hmm. and then also being bombarded with hydrogen and helium ions from the sun, those disrupt that structure at uh, very, very small scales. And that disruption causes changes in, in the properties we observe with you know, our, our orbiting spacecraft. Wow. So we got to study things very small to understand things very large. Hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. very cool. Mm -hmm. like that. Huh. Yeah. Can we go back to the new moon? Mm-hmm. Yes. The new yeah. moon. Because they're talking before we start recording <laughs> yeah. about the, uh, the, the new moon. Yeah. yeah. I just saw a headline on this. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, there's some some small body that's been captured, I guess. Yeah. Into, it's in an Earth orbit, right? Yeah. But it's an unstable Earth orbit, yes. so it won't stay. Yeah. Oh. And so how, and uh, I just saw, like, literally this morning, that article. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, oh, this is so cool. But then they talked about, oh, well, last year there was one that stayed in orbit for, like, six months or mm -hmm. something. How often do these small, yeah. do we call those satellites still? Yeah, I would call it a satellite. Um, I don't know how often these happen. This is really the first one that I have heard of. But I imagine, you know, these groups that are are characterizing the near-Earth asteroid population. Yeah. Uh, you know, they would know how, how often this happens. Uh, 
I don't know. It's not a not something yeah, I've I'm ever hoping. really thought about, but yeah. it's pretty cool. You know, have a have another little friend for a while, and then yeah. send them on their way. <laughs> <That's>, yeah, <laughs> the moon's little friend. Yeah, it's yeah, little friend. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just stopping by, seeing how you're all doing, and then gonna head out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so kid, students, high yes. school kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you if they wanted to? Because uh, I know you have you have like a couple degrees in planetary science. You have like a degree in like I want to say geology. Yeah, geological like engineering biology. actually, yeah. and in biology. Yeah. And, and so it's like all over the place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, what would you suggest that if if a student was listening to this or watching, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh, that would be so cool to be able to study this," yeah. which it would be. Yeah. Um, they're right. Yes. That, so, what advice would you give them? What are things that you need to concentrate, think about in order to plan mm-hmm. your career path to lead? So the first thing I would say would be to always keep an open mind because my career path has been all over the place. I started out in undergraduate as a geological engineering major, um, but then I also picked up a degree in biology along the way, which are very different things. One, the geological engineering was very, very practical and you know they were teaching me to design mines and to do mineral exploration for gold and mm-hmm. copper and those kinds of things. Um, and then the biology I focused mostly on ecology and um, you know studying the ecology of lake systems around um, the area that I went to college at. Those are very different things, but both gave me really important skill sets mm-hmm. for moving on uh, into planetary science. They gave me experience with critical thinking through through engineering and uh, you know having practical applications to the kinds of work that I do, but also you know field work and laboratory analysis mm-hmm. through biology. So those were both played into kind of helping me decide on what, it, what I wanted to study. So keep an open mind. You don't, it's not just one direction that can get you to planetary science. It's very multidisciplinary. You can come to it with degrees in chemistry or geology or physics or astronomy or biology. And, and so there's, you know, there's lots of opportunities to, to kind of come to this career path. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say definitely being in a STEM field though, I'm, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, that's going to give you the best background to, to kind of come into this. And then also if you can get experience doing research as an undergraduate mm-hmm. um, or doing some sort of internship even while you're in high school if you're, if you're really motivated to volunteer in a lab or even get paid to work in a lab, it gives you a taste for what research is like and, and kind of how the scientific method plays out on, you know, on the scale of the research problems that we look at. For planetary science, uh, it's getting more and more common to be able to get jobs outside of doing research, but the predominant thing that we we do as planetary scientists right now is still research. So you want to get experience uh, in that as early and as soon as you can, and also to help you decide if you even like it. You may not, you know, love it, and it's great to know that before you decide to go to graduate school and get a master's degree or a PhD, because it's a long time to spend doing something that you maybe don't enjoy that much, so... Do you have any highlights from research that you've done, maybe as an undergraduate or? or yeah. Sort of so another another tip I would give is uh, is to make them say no. So always apply to things even if you don't think that you're going to be qualified oh, to get I it. I like that advice. Because yeah. you never know what they're looking for, really, and and you should always just try. So when mm-hmm. I was an undergraduate student, I applied to an internship through the Lunar and Planetary Institute, mm-hmm. which partners with NASA Johnson Space Center and. I didn't have that much research experience yet, and I had done a little bit um, with a me- with a meteorite sample, but wasn't as experienced as a lot of people. Um, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to try. You never yeah. know. The worst they can say is no, and right. if they say no, it's not a big deal. And I actually got a slot in the internship, and so I went down and spent the summer at Johnson Space Center wow. working on lunar samples. This was which was amazing. I was a, a junior at the time, and a junior in. In college, in college, yeah, okay. mm-hmm. and so that basically set that you know set my path after that. Wow. Where I was like, this is amazing. Of course, I want to do this for the rest of my life. So, and I applied to that thinking I had no chance in actually getting selected, and it all worked out. So I would say apply to everything that you even think you might be tangentially qualified for. Yeah, you never know what uh, what exactly they're looking for. Dude, what are some good places to look for opportunity like or how did, did you just 
how did you find out about that? Yeah, so I found out about that from uh, one of my undergraduate professors who was on, you know, an email list where mm -hmm. they send out lots of opportunities. Uh, once you get into uh, college, the other thing I would suggest is to make your intentions known to your professors because they are much more connected in the community and they know about these opportunities that you may not um, have access to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to their announcements. And so it pays to go up to your professor after a lecture and say, I really enjoyed your lecture. I really want to do research in this area. Do you know of any opportunities? Do you have any tips? Do you, are you taking students in your lab to do research mm -hmm. as an undergrad? So just being you know, bold enough to go mm -hmm. and and tell them what you're looking for so that they can help you. We, as professors, we want to help students that are, you know, really motivated and interested. So don't feel like you have to do it all on your own. We're here to help you find the opportunities that might uh, be of interest to you. I love that advice, and that's mm -hmm. something as a high school teacher, I think that uh, I always tried to help my students understand. I would hear a lot from students that, well, I don't, I don't want to come and ask for help because I don't want my teachers to think that I'm dumb. And that's a, and I think that's a lot of kids fight that mm -hmm. because they don't understand yet that mm -hmm. we're here to help and we're here to. Yes, absolutely. And you know, this is being a scientist is really a collaborative endeavor. You know, you don't ever work on your own. I have collaborators that do all of my science with me, and that starts with finding the opportunities to build your career path. So it's. You know, it's a team effort. We, if you're motivated and, and you have an interest, we want to help you find an opportunity that suits your interest. And so it's always come talk to us, always send an email, always, you know, stop by our office and ask, do you know of anything? Because even if I don't know of anything, I'm going to find someone who does so that they can help you, you know, get on the path that you want to be on. That's just awesome. Yeah. I yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. I like that. Coolest thing you've seen or done? <sighs> too many. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer I like. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you top three. Okay. Oh, I like it. So, probably... Bit on this oh, podcast. There's a lot. Bit on our podcast. That's number one, right? Oh, absolutely. This, this, okay. That's a new peak, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to top that. <laughs> uh, so, I did a... Uh, after I finished my PhD, I did a postdoc at uh, Johnson Space Center. And while I was there, I got to know, you know, a bunch of people in the community. And one of them happened to be the wife of an astronaut who was launching into space very soon. And so I, knowing her and, and knowing him, you know, as I met him through her, I got to watch his launch from Mission Control oh. at Johnson Space Center. I got to watch his spacewalk that he did when he was on Space Station from Mission Control um, at, at JSC. And uh, I went over to their house for Thanksgiving that year, and he video chatted us from the Space Station during Thanksgiving dinner. Wow. So I got to talk to him while he was in space, which was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably number one, I'd have to say. Uh, number two was I got to watch the movie Apollo 13 in the original mission control that they used during the Apollo missions, oh. which was very cool. Uh, it was a really great experience. And you can see how accurate the, the movie replicated the mission mm -hmm. control that they had. And then the third one was probably just last week, or two weeks ago, when I was, again, back down in Houston. But I'm involved in this project to study a lunar sample that was collected on the Apollo 17 mission. So it's a core sample, which means it goes from, it's sampled from the surface to about 60 centimeters in depth below the surface. And it's a pretty rare type of sample. They didn't do many of those collections during mm -hmm. the uh, Apollo missions. And this particular one has never been opened since it was collected on Apollo 17. Oh, wow. So there's a new program where they're releasing a, a few new uh, specially curated samples for analysis. And I'm part of a team that was selected to study one of the, the Apollo 17 core. So I got to go down with my graduate student two weeks ago and help with the the first preliminary processing of the sample. So I was in the clean lab all day, you know, helping them actually scoop the material out of the core and probably one of the first 20 people in the world to actually see that sample. The astronauts haven't even seen it. They collected wow. it because it was in the tube and now yeah. they have taken it out of the tube and they're doing the processing. It was a surreal experience, once in a lifetime. Totally, totally awesome. Oh my goodness. So some pretty cool things yeah, I've got I got to do. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, right. Yeah, nothing right. too exciting, but... <laughs> kind of set the bar a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Ooh. Yeah. 
It's Very nice. Not a bad way to earn a living, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. It's out of this world. Uh, <laughs> Never heard that one before. Yeah, I bet you haven't. I just say those things because Sarah rolls her eyes when I do. She just shakes her head. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, thank you so, so much. much. We just appreciate you taking the time meeting. Chatting yeah, with us. and if anybody is listening that you know wants more information, my email is on the Purdue website. You can just search Excellent. my name and you'll find me. And yeah, send me an email. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. An outstanding on review. On iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Tweet us your science questions. At Purdue SOS. Until next time, be super. And remember. You are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.